some of my thunder's been taken already from the earlier introduction to the panel and so forth. But first of all, what an amazing day we've had today. Um, uh, for me, the time has flown so quickly, and whether that's my nerves being up here or whether the quality content we've seen is brilliant. So thanks to the speakers and the, the panelists so far. Um, when I was asked to present at the delivery conference, I was a bit confused initially what I would actually talk about. Um, delivery initially for me was about parcels, that sort of thing. And I was thinking, you guys want me to talk about parcels? Uh, maybe not. Okay, and then I started thinking a bit further about it. And actually, uh, as you saw part of my career path working in the newspapers, my first role working with the geographical information systems was actually that, doing physical deliveries. I was responsible for delivering 120,000 papers per day to re for a regional newspaper title. That was kind of the size of like the Manchester Evening News. As part of those responsibilities, I was also going around to the other regional newspapers and scheduling their vans, their routes, etc., um, for them to deliver their papers. Times have changed. In those days, I used to travel around the country, sometimes in a courtesy car. Maybe the accident wasn't my, my, my fault while I was in the courtesy car. But with massive 26-inch CRT monitors in the back of this car, and if any of you can remember it, um, laser disc players. Um, yeah, that's a, a piece of hardware we won't see again, or shouldn't ever see again. The way we consume media has significantly changed. And to give you an idea of the, the change in how we consume media now, the newspaper I used to work for, um, as I said in the time, was 120,000 papers a day. That has dropped to a fifth of what it is today. So because we're consuming so much digital media, we need to make sure that we keep up to pace with that, those changes. Otherwise, we're going to lose customers. I think it's a, a fair statement. Don't keep up, don't meet our customers' requirements, that, that will be gone. So since um, working in project management, which was mainly part of my role then, um, I got Prince2 qualified. I was hoping for a hiss at this point, but clearly from the previous part, I realize a lot of you are Prince2 qualified, so yeah, thumbs up, hope you enjoy that course. I paid for it myself. If you got your company to pay for it, even better. <laughs> So as, I, as my introduction was basically um, about my career path, I'm currently an Agile coach at Booking Go. We're the ground transport division for Booking.com. And I feel a bit, my slides are a bit, under, a bit underwhelmed compared to the previous presenters. Because you work in the digital environment, mine are very corporate, and I'm really sorry for that. So I apologize now. OK. Um, we're in this venue. I thought it was only appropriate that we started with the joke. We're talking about delivery. And so, again, it has to be a delivery-related joke. So before I move on to my presentation itself, here's a quick one for you. A friend of mine recently lost his job as a courier driver. He just wasn't able to deliver the goods. <laughs> I thought I was going to get no laughter. <laughs> it was a really bad dad joke. <laughs> um, but my point is, in this presentation, I'm going to give you five tips on how to improve um, and avoid that face of my, um, my friend. I'm there. However, before I get started, I really need some help from you. So um, this is really unusual, because when I'm in meetings and so forth, I'm always telling the team, put your phones away, put your, Macs, your laptops away. But I actually want you to get them out. If you can, if, you can, if you're already on the Wi-Fi, great. If you can use your own data, even better. Um, jump onto slido.com for me. When you get there, there will be nothing on the screen, so I'll just forewarn you of that. <coughs> I'm just looking for a heads up when you've been able to connect. Okay, are we getting there? <laughs> Technical issues. Okay, some of you are there. I can see some screens you've got there. 
the um, thing for Slido Brill. Okay, hold fire. I'm going to come back to this. I just need you to be logged in right now. Um, and later in my presentation, I'll be returning to it. So don't just ditch it off for the moment to keep that web page open. Okay, I want you to just relax. Take a moment from your stressful lives, take in this picture, and take a deep breath with me. The Agile Manifesto. We're uncovering better ways of de developing software by doing this and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over process and tools, <coughs> working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change other than following a plan. While we value the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. If you're not familiar with the manifesto, I will just um, show it here. So what I'm saying is, as people working in the agile world, we value the stuff here on the left more so than the stuff on the right. So individuals and interactions, working software, customer collaboration, and responding to change. So I have a question for you, hence the reason for the sliding. If you could bring one agile technique to that island with you, what would it be? Would it be your daily stand-ups, your sprint planning and reviews, your prioritized backlog, or retrospectives, or cross-functional teams? So hopefully your devices have come alive. Well, the numbers are slowly going up, getting some, some data. By the way, this is a really good way of me gathering data without asking you for it. <laughs> okay, the numbers slowly drifting up. I think there's more people here than the 56, but we'll, we'll go with what we've got, which is cool. waiting for the tech to catch up. Got ahead of myself there. OK, so it's looking like when it re reappears that the daily stand-ups has actually was in a winning position, if I saw it correctly. Oh, retrospectives. Retrospectives are brilliant. It's overtaken. So two things I've done with this poll. One is so that you're not biased by anybody else. I didn't show you the results straight away. And secondly, um, here you can see the results. So for those which are maybe having some challenges seeing the screen here, retrospectives are sitting there at 34%, um, daily stand-ups at 30 cross-functional teams at uh, 24%, and the backlog and sprint reviews cover 11%. Brilliant. It's worked because I wanted you to choose that one. Thank you very much for leading me straight into my rest of the presentation. For me, the retrospectives are the key part of the um, events and part of Agile. Okay, Agile in two words then. So David Howritz um, from Retrium um, describes Agile in two words, continuous improvement. And I've got to say, I agree totally with him. This is what Agile is all about. It's making those changes frequently. And we know this to be true at product level. Um, every two weeks or whatever your iteration period is, we need to be making changes, um, delivering stuff to your stakeholders and your customers. But let's not forget, we should also be making changes to your processes, your ways of working. Don't sit and not do anything with those. They need to be changing as well as delivering stuff to your customers. So if you're working the same way that you did a year ago, um, six months ago, six weeks ago, I'd contest whether you're actually doing Agile or being Agile. Just returning back to the principles as well in Agile. So the 12th Agile principle states, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective and then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. Now, I'm not sure whether this is the retrospective is the last event um, in the sprint cycle just coincidentally happens to align with the, the 12th Agile Principle, or whether um, by the time you've read the previous 11, you've actually got to this point and gone, I can't remember any of that. What was that about? 
But this is how I often see the statement and how teams typically behave. At, the, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective and we seem to forget the key part here is the tune and adjust its behavior. For me, no, respective, no retrospective means no opportunity to improve. And that's also a huge time to celebrate as well. Retrospectives are often seen as this um, event where it's just about negative stuff. We do pull out some good stuff and we talk about it, but the action items are all this um, stuff which is a bit negative um, or we need to improve. Also use that opportunity to celebrate with the team. Don't just leave it as a just collecting um, action items um, ceremony. But don't be fooled, retrospectives come in all shapes and sizes and you've mostly all done this at some point. So whether you've been in a meeting, given some feedback during a meeting, whether you've been to a restaurant, left feedback for that restaurant, been to a hotel, um, done staff surveys, I know some of that was talked about earlier on. Um, all these are retrospective feedback which you should act on or someone should be acting on in order to improve. If you don't do this, your teams will soon become disillusioned. So here's the typical cycle which you can see for retrospectives. So first of all, we have a retrospective. Brilliant, we've got everybody in the room. Um, that gives our teams a voice. Um, so we've actually got the opportunity to air the issues which we've got. Um, the team then hopefully are engaged through that and provides engagement. And ultimately, the team um, and organizational, organizational performance improves. So here are some typical complaints I hear about retrospectives, and I'd just like a few hands up if you can as I go through these. So first of all, people aren't engaged in retrospectives. Anybody experience that? Cool. Um, nothing ever changes after the retro. Oh, maybe a few too many hands there. Um, it's hard to share and learn what from other teams. Does anybody experience that? So you don't know what other teams have got? Yeah. I think this might be a winner. Um, my retrospectives are boring. Oh, not as many as I thought. Okay. And most of the impediments we identify are not fixable by this team. Anybody experience that? Yeah. Okay, cool. So what I plan to do now is I'm going to take you through how to get from this and disengage point and, give you some, and get to practical value. Here's my five steps for you. Okay, first of all, create an environment of equality. So earlier on, we talked about these soft skills or, um, and how important they are to the teams and security and trust. The first thing you need to do is build trust within the team. It's extremely hard. It takes time. And if you've got teams which are ever changing, that's made even worse by that. But if you can, start building trust. Now, at Booking Go, we go through, and I wouldn't, I'm mostly not exaggerating, thousands of post-its every week. Um, and part of that is actually to do with this building trust within teams, which allows you to get, give some anonymity to the items for people to put them up and post them. So it's a mechanism for that. And the other thing which post-it notes do, which people don't realize, it actually gets away with an, from an issue called production blocking. And that's where everybody's trying to voice stuff at the same time. So it allows everybody to have a voice on a piece of paper, and then we can carry on that conversation. So they are really important. Um, tools to get there. Also, if you've got remote teams or near shore, offshore, or even people working from home, don't forget there are various online tools which you can use. So do a quick search of the web. There's plenty of free stuff there. There's some paid for stuff as well. And so they can also provide that um, element of security for your teams. Secondly, do something physical. Now, by this, I don't mean you need to run around the room doing loads of stuff, um, although I can refer back to one retrospective where a team did it which brought in boxing gloves and pads, and it was actually a physical retro which we went through. Um, so yeah, it can be done that way. But by this, what I mean is, um, if you've got an action, for instance, that your team are saying, or the product owner is saying, you never speak to me, team, you need to give me, give me more updates. Get it out on somewhere physical and create a chart of it. Ask the team every time they speak to the product owner or the product owner themselves to actually mark that off. Next time you have a retro, you've got data. And if the team then say, or the product owner says, 
we're not talking to the product owner anymore, or very much. We've got a list of saying, oh, yes, you did speak some five times. Can we improve that next sprint? So fairly, fairly easy. Some other examples might be um, some teams are really interested in their cycle time and how fast stuff's getting through. Um, yeah, great. Jira does a so okay ish job of measuring cycle time. Um, but if, you dot, if you've got a physical board, dot your tickets. And then you can see very quickly whether that card or that story is actually waiting in that column too long or has been there multiple times. If you really want to get sophisticated, you can change the colors of the dots based on the columns. And that way, you can then measure its wait time through those columns as well. And the final one um, is show and tells. So I've been in an organization before where the team were complaining they weren't doing enough show and tells. We literally got a post-it note, put it onto the board, the Kanban board, and every time they did a show, show and tell, they five bar gated it. Overnight, that behavior changed, and there was no complaints at the end of that sprint, and there haven't been subsequently. And the team have actually asked for it to keep going as well, so that's another um, plus. My third tip for you would be create a retrospective radiator. Get your problems and action items out in the open, hiding them in Jira, in Trello, or whatever other tools you're using doesn't um, surface those issues. It will remain with the teams, and unless you've got really strong owners of those actions, they'll just go somewhere to die. Um, we use a tool at Booking Go called Confluence. It is a graveyard of many action items. <laughs> I'm being honest. <laughs> um, but if you can get these items out in the open, it's a real big shift and has huge value because suddenly other people can see them. You're not, you're not the only ones isolated seeing those actions. Okay, I thought I'd get a bigger response, but I didn't, but I'll, I'll go with it. Um, my retros are boring. If you are struggling with your retros and they are boring, typically this, this, what I've seen is that people are using the same facilitator over and over again. So you get the same type of retro, the same format going there. So my top tips here would be, if you can, um, have a circle of facilitators. Circle them through the teams. That has an, an additional benefit because they will also see other teams' items and be able to surface those as well. So if you've got similar cross-team issues, they'll be surf more likely to be surfaced. Ask the team whether they want to actually facilitate there's team members who actually actually want to do this stuff, but they're not that confident enough to be asked, or actually volunteer, I should say. So ask them whether they want to do it. And if you're still struggling there, ask your organization if someone wants to do it. So I was in an organization where someone from the HR went on a facilitation course, and they actually came back absolutely fired up, wanted to keep on reusing their skills. And as you know, if you learn something, if you don't go and apply it, in, Pretty soon, you, you lose it. She was back into our building, and a few weeks later, she was facilitating retrospectives for us and brought a whole new dimension um, for that retrospective and following ones for the teams. And my fifth step here would be up and out aggregation. So what do I mean by this? This is where you go to a retro from team, and team A says, yeah, we've got a problem with this, but it, we can't solve it. And then you go into another retrospective, and Team B goes, we've got a problem with this, and we can't solve it. And this is the same problem. They can't own it. Neither team's going to own it. They haven't got the power, the knowledge, whatever that may be. So up and out aggregation is about finding these common um, issues, surfacing, surfacing, as I say, having a circle of facilitators can help with that. And also then making them visible to the management layer. And if you've got multiple teams with the same problems, you're more likely to get that buy-in from other teams. So in terms of how easy this is to do, I've kind of ranked them easy, from easy to hard for you on the, on the list here. So yes, yeah, so starting from the top, under your control, create an environment of equality. You can all go and buy some post-it notes. That's the simple part. The up and out aggregation, that's a real challenge. I'm, t I'm still challenged with that, trying to get that visible. But fortunately, because of my role as a coach, I'm working across multiple teams, having a coaching department and team members around me, we can surface some of that um, through our conversations as well. So that's another way which you could do that. 
OK, returning back to your phones, then I have another poll. Now, for this one, um, you can, there's multiple answers. So, so which of these have you done to improve your retrospective? So have you created an environment of equality? Um, done something physical, created a retrospective radiator, a circle of um, facilitators, or up and out aggregation? See what we've got. Brilliant. So this kind of aligns to that easy and hard. So from the results point of view, creating an environment of equality is there stacked at the top, and yeah, the real challenging one is that up and out aggregation. Right. Cool. So before I conclude, has anybody got any questions on that? So somebody at the top there. Actually, it's just a question, not specifically. Maybe you're going to cover it afterwards. But um, when when you get this good data from the retrospective, how do you create a sort of retrospective backlog to start implementing it? Do you try and implement one thing at a time, or focus on the most important thing that the team has agreed on? I'd be interested to know how you action those things. Okay, so. My way of working with the teams is I always encourage them not to take more than three actions out of any retrospective. We always max it at, uh, max it at that. Um, otherwise, chances are they're not going to get done. If it's something really simple, like, I don't know, someone needs to buy cake on Friday, yeah, add it into the action items, that's fine. But um, it, more, on a more serious note, yeah, I, I would limit the number of action items that you pull out um, in his um, retrospective. If you're familiar with dot voting, that's a good way of surfacing um, so what's the, what the team feel is the priority at that time. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So let me take you back to the island then. So regardless of whether you're working in a scrum team, scrum ban, waterfall, whatever methodology or framework you're using, here are the three things I would um, take away, I'd like you to take away. First of all, re retrospect frequently. Don't wait months after an event's happened. Get onto that and retrospect straight away. Um, an example would be, we had an outage yesterday. There was a retrospective within 10 minutes of that outage being sorted so that we could clear the decks and move forward. So don't wait months and months um, for those to happen. People won't remember what happened. Make improvements on the back of those um, action items as well. So if stuff has been surfaced, do something about it. Otherwise, your teams will just get disillusioned. And finally, don't become that courier driver unable to deliver the goods. Thank you. <laughs>